I'm with the Denver Urban Spectrum, as well as the Window Television Show on Your World TV with Noble Trinity Media and Adulawo TV. Today, I have uh, an amazing person as our guest, Miss Darnisha Harrison, who is the founder and CEO of Inaid Therapeutics, uh, an incredible research firm that is making strides in uh, fighting COVID-19, um, the novel coronavirus, which of course is uh, part of this global pandemic that uh, both us in America and internationally people are fighting. And so we're gonna be talking today with you, Ms. Harrison, about your work, uh, which I'm so excited about and uh, just can't wait to see the day when this thing is behind us. So I'm gonna just open it up with the first question for our interview today. And uh, so I just would like to start it off with prior to founding your own research lab, Innate Therapeutics, you graduated from Louisiana, Louisiana State University. You spent three years as a scientist at Amgen, which is an international uh, expert in biotechnology. Then you spent 16 years working in pharmaceutical research and business development. What else can you tell viewers about your background and the expertise that further affirms that you're qualified to lead the research of this magnitude? Thank you, Tashia, and thanks for having me on your show. Um, that's an excellent question. You know, even prior to um, my years of college education, the way I knew that I wanted to be a scientist was I worked as a scientist um, in a wonderful program at LSU, Louisiana State University's veterinary school. And I worked seemingly ironically in the epidemiology department and community health. Community health is none other than public health. And I did some tremendous research around different bacteria the very famous E. coli. Loved the research that I was doing, loved the lab that I worked in, and that sparked me to want to major as a scientist. And so I segued right in school as a microbiology major. Found microbiology to be very, very practical as a science. Um, and back in those days, late 80s, early 90s, um, in microbiology, we were learning what was then cutting edge techniques um, in molecular biology, you know, just um, PCR, Western blots, Southern blots, you know, just all kinds of cutting edge um, biochemistry um, lab techniques, right? And microbiologists were having to learn these as well. And so it was just the most fun Thing ever. And I thought I was the most fortunate girl in the world to be in a major studying something that I absolutely loved. And so once I graduated LSU, I landed a job at the University of Georgia as a microbiologist. Again, I felt like I was the most fortunate girl in the world. And so to succinctly answer your question, it was really all those years of research, research, research and development, research and development on E. coli and even other bacteria um, and working with some of the best professors, PhDs, other scientists like myself um, that qualifies me um, to do exactly what I'm doing today. And that's run my very own company as a CEO scientist. Oh yeah, the, the genius section, clearly, that <laughs> you're a part of. You're very awesome. kind. Awesome. Well, with all the research that has been done on COVID-19, of course, there seems to be still a lot that we don't know. Um, what we do know is that some people's immune system has the ability to fight the virus off. Others, even those who are healthy, can't fight the virus off. And of course, initially we thought that it was people who were elderly 
and people who had an underlying condition who were at risk from dying from COVID. But now we know different because, you know, completely healthy people have lost their lives to this virus. Can you explain using the most layman terms possible, what makes COVID, i.e. the novel coronavirus, so deadly? So let's add a little bit of balance to that, Tashia, if I may. Yes. Um, SARS-CoV is the actual virus that causes COVID-19 infection, okay? And once a person has COVID-19 infection, actually 80% of those a roughly 80% of those who have the infection are mildly, moderately, and asymptomatically impacted by the virus. So it's 20% or less who actually die from the virus. What makes COVID so much of a nemesis to the world, if you will, is the fact that it's so highly transmissible. Mm. It's not the fact that it's so deadly. Yes, it, 20%, we don't want anybody to die. You take 10 people, that means two out of 10 may die if you look at statistics that succinctly. Um, but the majority of the cases are mild to moderate or asymptomatic and people live. Um, what happens with that 20%? What we've learned in the scientific community is that, and usually what happens when patients do take a turn for the worse when they've been infected with COVID-19, um, it happens very suddenly. And, and what we've learned thus far is that there's something called, um, how do I put it very simply, there's an immune system response in your body um, in the, called the histamine complexes, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is normal, everybody's body has it. Um, and, and there's two words, or we can say six words. Within that histamine complex or involved in that histamine complex, shall I accurately say, is something called interleukin-6. And when those IL-6s get involved, a patient just goes downhill and dies. And what your immune system is doing is trying to help, but it goes overboard. It goes overboard all of a sudden, um, almost like it's trying to attack the virus and save you, but the IL-6s just go overboard. Um, you know, our bodies are, we were created in complete balance. Um, and we were created when disease arrives in our bodies or is introduced in our body, the body is designed to handle that very well, just like a cut on the finger, right? Um, so I kind of went a long round and about way to tell you some of the things that we have learned as scientists, some of the infectious diseases experts um, and physicians, clinicians around the world, what they've learned about what happens when the, in the rare case that someone may die, um, that is what we have been able to explain um, what happens. And then sometimes there are co comorbidities um, that's not a single factor, however, um, but certainly that histamine complex with IL-6 has certainly played a, played a factor in that. Mm -hmm. And we are doing some discovery research around that particular IL-6 that I mentioned. Wow, that's, pr that's pretty amazing. And so, so when the immune system goes berserk, and it, I guess it starts attacking the organs is what I've been reading about. It starts attacking the healthy organs, the cells in the body. Is that where the replicating or the replication takes place? Um, has that already taken place? It, it is already taking place. And that's why the body starts that process uh, of trying to 
correct and balance all of that, but it does it almost in an imbalancing way, right? Um, trying to fight something so hard a little too late, if that makes sense. Yes. And I'm sorry to explain this in layman's terms. No, so. you're doing great. You're doing <laughs> yeah. great. But I hope that made sense, you know. Yes. Um, but I want to, again, in adding balance, most infections are mild, moderate, and asymptomatic. And that's about 80% of them. Okay. We certainly care about those 20%. Um, and there are companies like Innate Therapeutics and many other of my counter colleagues who certainly are doing amazing research, amazing development um, that targets not just that 80%, but also the 20% who, who may um, succumb to, to the virus, mm -hmm. to the infection. So, yes. Dr. Harrison, how important is it that the trials that they're running, that those are tested on people of color, African-Americans and Latinos who we know are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. How important is it that they do the so trial? I'm gonna add a little mm -hmm. bit of balance some okay. more. Yes. First, I am not a physician, nor am I a PhD. So to accurately address me, it would be just Miss Harrison or Darnisha. Yes. Going by my first name is perfectly fine. Um, you can even call me Nisha if you'd like. Yes, yes. Um, but how important is it to address those of color? Yes. Um, and I have to tell you, my answer may not be as popular um, because SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is no respecter of persons. Mm. Um, a hospital emergency room would accept a person of color, whether they are African-American, whether they are Hispanic, whether they are um, Native American, mm -hmm. they will accept them in an emergency room situation, just like they would a Caucasian. Um, and this is a pandemic, pan meaning all. Mm -hmm. It has impacted the world. Um, so some of the disproportions that are usually spoken about in medicine, I really don't think we're seeing that. Uh, to the st statistically impactful numbers that we have seen disproportionate medicine um, in other areas is, is what I'll say. Um, and when you look at public health, issues, um, you know, this is impacting air, uh, Africa, places in the Congo, um, Costa Rica, some of the most pristine beaches in the Caribbean are impacted. You know, at one point, Australia was greatly impacted. Um, of late, Australia has done a phenomenal job um, getting their COVID-19 cases down to zero new cases hats off to, to my wonderful colleagues um, and friends in Australia. Um, but you know, I'm, Singapore has been affected. There's in, in, in some places in the world, the global numbers look different than other places. You know, the richest county in the USA has been impacted, the poorest county in the USA. So again, this is a pandemic, pan means all. And it is important that we all have equal access. Um, I don't think they took the vaccine to a zip code at, at a nursing home in one area of the U.S. versus another. I think that everyone is understanding that this pandemic um, has impacted everyone, no, no matter race, creed, sexual orientation, or preference. Yes. I know that President Biden has uh, said that he is going to make, uh, according to the numbers that the CDC has reported, there was a higher instance of infection rate and the mortality rate in African-American and Latino communities. They're saying that percentage wise that those two communities are among the largest percentages of new infections right now, which 
is weird because that's exactly what happened with HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, President Biden or President-elect Biden soon, <laughs> he is saying that he is going to make African-Americans, people of color, seniors, and of course, essential workers, the uh, priority in terms of distributing the vaccine. And, and I know we're going to talk about that in a minute. I want to get to your amazing drug in just a minute. But do you think that that, that that is important? Do you think that that signifies in some way that there is a problem um, statistically that we're, we haven't seen or documented? We don't have the data to prove it, but do you think that's a real issue? I, I do think if the data is showing it, then certainly we have a real issue. Um, and it may be something that I was not so focused on um, because as a company, um, we're politically agnostic, we're racially agnostic, um, and that affords us the opportunity to make sure we stay balanced in what we do. Um, and, I, and I say that because many of the diseases that we focus on actually are disproportionately endemic in countries where those of color reside. Mm -hmm. So for example, our tropical disease um, platform where we're developing drugs for dengue, Zika, West Nile virus, mm -hmm. those are endemic in countries like um, Southeast Asia, Africa, et cetera. Um, so what we do as a company is we stay agnostic, um, racially, et cetera. And that also allows for us to have a diverse um, work environment as well. You know, um, even in our humble beginnings, it allows us to have a diverse work environment. But certainly um, what President elect Biden has decided to do, I think that's excellent because now we have a plan, right? Yeah. Um, and I think he's answering the numbers and that's a good thing. Yes. One more question along that lines of, of race and ethnicity. And I think it's wonderful that your company and its perspective is representative of the world that we live in. It, you know, your, your work is speaking to everybody, which is the way it should be. So I think that's absolutely wonderful. And, uh, but one more question, there has been reports and a lot of people have said that when black folks or African-Americans, Latinos, POC, go to get treatment or seek treatment for COVID, that there are differences in the way that they are being treated. For example, mm -hmm. they're saying that non-POC people are getting uh, treated quicker and more frequently for the, the, the things that come with COVID like the pneumonia and the body aches and you know all the other viral symptoms that come with COVID and that black folks are being sent home with those symptoms. Now, of course, for sure, this doesn't have the data yet to back it up, but I've read a lot of press and media that has indicated reports of that and as well as reports by essential workers. There's a story of a woman out of New York, a black woman who had worked at a hospital for 25 years and got the virus and went there to get treatment and they refused to treat her, sent her back home. She had pneumonia, she ended up passing away. Mm -hmm. And so her family you know, was very, very upset that here's a institution where she served and she could not get help, they did not help her. And, uh, and then there was another similar case at the same institution where a physician there literally put his wife on the top of the list for, for care and treatment, and he was not a person of color. So I'm just wondering in your, do you think those are real issues as a person who is an expert in the field as a researcher, do you think that's an issue that part of this fight, we're gonna to have to take a look at that, those type of disparities? So I what I think is that, when those things happen, we have to address it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I think we have to address it individually where it occurred. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
is that a systemic problem? It may be or it may not be. What I encourage any one of my family and friends always have is take your health care into your own hands. Mm -hmm. Don't just trust the physicians or the, or the nurses or the clinicians. Ask questions. I don't care how busy they are. Ask questions. Let them know that you care. Okay. You don't want to, you know, waste their time asking questions that something you simply read off the internet. Um, but, but be, be knowledgeable about your own body. If they give you a medicine, ask them about it. Don't just take it. And so certainly issues like that should be addressed. Um, I look at fighting something in a different sort of way, you know, at an aid, you know, an aid means divine, by the way. <laughs> and so I think if you fight something, you're giving it bad energy, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But I think if you address it, if you face it, if you say, okay, this is the situation. Now let's come up with solutions. Okay. You can't have the same mentality that created a situation and expect to solve it, not with that same mentality. So what we do is we come with solutions. Um, and so our healthcare systems really all around the world, but in, especially in our very own United States of America are overwhelmed yes and so perhaps that was an oversight you know one that god knows it could have helped that lady live and i don't make any excuses for anything like that um so what do we do do we build larger hospitals do we um i don't have the answer for that hospital but i can tell you what innate therapeutics has some answers yes. um and that's what we're doing is addressing some of these issues um around the hospitals overburdening um and it's part of, it's a, a a very um large part of what we're doing to help bring solutions and i mean right now solutions to COVID-19. Um, so we're, we're bringing solutions. Let's yeah. talk about those solutions. In May 2020, after extensive scientific research, you filed a patent for Inu 200, supporting a groundbreaking discovery of an antiviral drug that shows strong scientific evidence of blocking the, the two proteins, and I took this right off your site, as you could tell, mm -hmm. that causes COVID to invade healthy cells. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what is the process, first of all, the testing process that happens before a drug can be released for public consumption? And I know that you know we've got to protect Inu 200 because it can very well be the thing that saves all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Like we need this now. You said that so rightly. And, and I hope that, you know, we get this message out how important it is to have this drug out now and have it available to people. I hope that the right people will get behind this research and get this fast track. But we're, first of all, can you talk about just the process that you have to take a drug through to get it to the point where you can like submit it to the FDA? Okay, yeah. yes, absolutely. That's a good question, Tashina, thank you. Um, it, it's, it's quite the process. It's a process that I love. I, I know drug discovery and development. Like the back of my hand, I sometimes dream about it, right? <laughs> I, I do it so much and know it so well. Um, but the process is once you have what's considered um, what we call a new chemical entity, entity, in other words, you have a discovery that you feel targets a particular disease. Not that you feel, but that your data shows in discovery 
targets a particular disease. You then do what's called, and I'm simplifying this greatly, but you do what's called um, proof of concept testing. All this is done in the lab, right? So you go from discovery to proof of concept testing. After that, you then, uh, and your proof of concept testing shows, yes, this is showing positive results. So you then go from there into your animal testing under very, very safe and humane conditions, you test your drug in animals, animal models that will most closely develop the disease as it does in humans or most closely mimic the disease in humans. As long as that is showing safe in an animal model, um, no harm to the major organs in the animal that it excretes appropriately, um, not staying in the animal model, but targets the specific organs, the disease specifically, okay, and then excretes well, you then start a human clinical trial once you know it's safe in, safe in animals. Those trials are phase one trials where you taste, test for safety in humans. Then there's a phase two trial where you taste testing for safety, as well as trying to see how effective the drug is, which is what we call efficacy. Phase three, you're always still testing for safety, but phase three is primarily efficacy. After phase three, if you have all excellent data, the FDA then takes all of that data into a packet and you have what's called a new drug application. If that is approved, your drug can be approved for commercialization. Now, I skipped one little step again. Um, before you even get into humans, you have to have an application called investigational new drug. Okay, before you start your phase one, two, and three. So now we're all ready to become drug developers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, and it can good. sound like an arduous process, yeah. but it's really not. Now for the succinct process, you know, um, how did we get so far so fast, right, with ENU-200? Well, first of all, ENU-200 is a repurposed drug. What that means, Tashia, is that it is either currently on the market for a different indication, or it once was on the market for a different indication, okay? It's a fancy way of saying it's a generic. We just call it repurpose now, okay? Yeah. Um, and so ENU200 is repurposed. What does that mean? It means we have human safety data already. So after we've got proof of concept data from the lab showing that the drug does show discovery and then that proof of concept that it is indeed proving what we saw from the discovery standpoint, we can in almost 100% of the time, skip all the animal studies because we don't have to prove safety. And you can usually get right into what we consider a phase 2B slash 3 clinical trial, okay? And that's where, because you still want to make sure, although we know the drug is safe, the safety is always the most important thing, right, um, in, in a human subject. And so we're looking at those safety numbers, but what we're really doing also is making sure it is effective, looking at that efficacy. And so that's the stage we are at with ENU 200. We are actually literally ready to put labels on our clinical material and get it shipped to our clinical manufacturing site so that we can start our in-home self-dosing clinical trial. So when you mentioned that 
you know, some of the patients of certain um, race and demographics are sent home, I'm thinking, oh, good, they maybe they'd be great Perfect. candidates for Perfect. our in-home yeah. self-dosing clinical trial. Yeah. Um, with the NU200, we're focused on the mild, moderate, asymptomatic patient pool, okay, that 80%. Um, and these are in-home self-dosing clinical trials. We're helping the overburdening of hospitals. Mm -hmm. The patients can simply go home and quarantine and start taking a medicine that will hopefully, we still don't know until we get the data, help improve their symptoms by treating their COVID-19 symptoms um, and helping them get well in record time versus you know, having to run the quarantine out, you mm -hmm. know, instead of taking 10 to 14 days, perhaps maybe a three day or five day, we don't know yet again, again, until we get into those trials. So that's one way we're helping patients. Um, they'll be able to use our very own software mm -hmm. that is app based um, to do the clinical trial at home. So we've made it very easy for them. Also web based. So I mean, a two-year-old could do it, right? Um, although we, we're not enrolling two-year-olds, but just um, it's that simple. Yes. to let you know how simple it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we're also incorporating medical mobile units. If you can imagine um, a semi-truck, right? Mm -hmm. So an 18-wheeler. Um, we, we can transform and I say we, with collaborative partners, an 18-wheeler into about a 10 to 12-bed hospital wow. with state-of-the-art equipment like ventilators, oxygen, whatever is needed. One doctor and or one physician's assistant or nurse practitioner can handle 10 to 12 beds. Um, these units are mobile. Um, we have a vision and an intention to put about 150 of these mobile medical units um, in about a 50 to 70 acre space, thereby again answering the overburdening of hospitals. So we've got a lot of good solutions um, that will be um, helping to answer the COVID-19 pandemic and helping to eliminate it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, President Biden, I hope you're listening and <laughs> I hope that you will consider this as a really wonderful option. And uh, because this is, this is what America needs um, and to find out that it is this far along, that it's a drug that you know, it's pretty much been, you know, used and approved before, and it's a repurposing of, of a drug that we know works. We already know the drug works. And or I, something I, else for a different indication. Yeah, so we know it's safe. Indication. So yeah. we know it's safe, at least. But, yeah, it's not, it's not going to kill people. We, we right. know that. It's side, it may have side effects or whatever, but very minimal, <laughs> very minimal side effects. So I, I mean, as of December 15th, course, CNN released a report stating that every 60 seconds, another American dies of COVID. To date, as you know, I'm sure over 300,000 Americans have died of COVID-related complications. 16 million people now affected with COVID-19. What is needed by your company, Enate Therapeutics, to complete the research trials and fast track the approval for ENU 200. What kind of backing, you know, what, what is needed so we can start saving people? The right financial backing. Um, with the right financial backing, we could um, have a product commercialized by or before summer. Um, we could have these mobile medical units as early as February. So this winter even. Um, and if we went to the FDA or other regulatory agencies and asked them about emergency 
emergency use authorization, we may be able to have a commercial product well before summer. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if Amazon, we need those trucks. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, and we've actually identified those um, medical, the mobile units. We have all of that identified. And um, one thing I did not mention is that ENU 200 is a capsule. So it's one of the most convenient dosage forms, pill or capsule um, for a person to take. So it's ease of distribution to all over the world. Um, the ingredients within it are what are, are, are very simple ingredients, if you will. So the manufacturing process is very simple. So getting it manufactured commercially and to different areas around the world is, a, is, is just ease. No special containment or storage um, issues around it. So um, again, we feel very optimistic. So this is not a vaccine. This is a treatment. This is a therapeutic that treats. Yes. Wow. That and you so just swallow the pill upon. It's kind of like um, the moment you feel the sniffle of a cold, mm -hmm. you go to your drugstore, you get um, Tylenol cold mm -hmm. caplets or what have you. In this instance, you just tell your doctor and he'd say, okay, I'm going to give you a new 200 mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'll start taking the capsules <laughs> um, right away. So it'll have a brand name by then, but certainly, yeah. Well, we are, we, it's, it's time. And I hope that yes. this, we can get the word out everywhere across the world very quickly so that we can minimize the loss of life. And I just wanna thank you, Ms. Harrison, for the work that you are doing that you have already done to find an effective treatment for COVID-19. And I hope we hear good news soon that this is rolling out and, uh, and then you can celebrate uh, across the world that people are, are getting well. And, there and, is uh, hope. Yes. yes. There's yeah. many, there are many solutions and, and we have many of them and, and we intend to get them out to the masses very, very soon. One last thing, if I may add, yes. what yes. makes me qualified to do this I would be remiss if I did not talk about the amazing team and our collaborators. The team of scientists that I have that work within an aid have been with me since the beginning mm -hmm. and they are the best of the best scientists and geniuses in the world. Um, and they know who they are. Um, our collaborators, um, UCAM in Spain, our discovery collaborators, um, others in New York um, that we collaborate with Discovery, um, Catalan, whom we collaborate with, um, and the list goes on. Um, you know who you are. So as this may get out there to more um, outlets, just know that I am qualified because of you. We are qualified because of all of us and the world has hope because of what Anaid is doing and because of all of us. And I thank you, all of my team at Anaid. Wow. Congratulations to you and your entire team. And we're gonna make sure that this interview goes global with uh, our, our news partners, both with the Urban Spectrum, as well as Your World TV and Adulawo TV, which is our African partner. Oh, fantastic. That streams live all across the, the continent of Africa, West Africa, to be fantastic. specific. So we're going to be making sure this video gets aired on all those platforms. Back to the beginning, to the dawning of your power. Mothers and the matriarch find in a sacred hour. In the divine feminine is where we find the truth. Open up your cipher and put water on our roots. It's time for every woman to be seen and even heard. Portal is now open, you must come and speak your words. The legacy of women must be written in the sky. And when you see a woman, tell her, God is right.